welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Well, like I said, we're going to get into the word of the Lord tonight. I'm excited. I believe that God has a message for you. Let me say that again. I believe that God has a message for you. So you didn't come into this place to hear from a man or a woman, from the young or the old. It's not about coming to hear what men have to say or to, to, to hear a band or anything like that, even though that's all fine and wonderful. Listen, we came into this place tonight not to hear any of that stuff. We came to hear from God. Never go to church to hear from a man or a woman or a certain individual or a band or anything. No, not what this is about. This is us coming together, getting the wisdom of God, applying it to our lives and watching what God does as it changes the world that we live in. So tonight, will you honor the Lord? Will you stand with me? I'm going to get down on my knees and go before the Lord in prayer, and let's invite the Holy Spirit to come and to be our teacher. Father, tonight we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, we give you thanks. We give you praise. God, it's so good to be in your presence already. Lord, you inhabit the praises of your people, God, and, and truly tonight you've already done wondrous things. God, we thank you for what you've already done in this place. We don't want to stop there, Lord. We want to Go further, go farther, go deeper with you, Lord. So tonight, as we open up your word, we pray that you would open us up to receive it. God, that you would open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, open our hearts to understand. Lord, may we be the good ground where the word is sown, and may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. God, we pray that you impart grace to the hearer. God, give us the wisdom, the vision, the direction, the understanding that we need, Lord. Correct us where we need to be corrected, God. We thank you that you're a loving father who disciplines his children, God, for our good. And, Lord, that you have great plans, plans for a future and a hope, God. We just give you thanks and praise for that. God, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we would ask it for all the churches, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet, that are both preaching and teaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, here in the Inland Empire as well as around the world. Lord, there are brothers and sisters. God, we don't think of ourselves as any better than anybody else, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building one kingdom. That's yours, Lord. Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement, and we say, amen. Amen. You may be seated. And tonight, grab your Bibles, and we're going to be going to a subject, and I I had started a series quite a while ago called Guidelines for Living. Part number one, we found out, and we read in a verse, uh, Micah chapter 6, verse number 8, that God has some guidelines for us. And the guidelines are there to give us some direction, to to help us to stay on the right track, and they're kind of like the painted lines on the road. They help you to find a direction. They help you to know where you can and cannot go. They, they keep you safe. Yes, it may come in the form of, uh, you know, something that, that this is a line, don't cross this. And there's a warning if you do. And sometimes we see that as a negative thing from the Word of God. But really, it's there for our safety. Really, it's there for our benefit. Really, it's there so that we can get going in the direction that we need to go in our life. And so part number one, we read in Micah chapter 6, verse number 8, it says, He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? So these are some requirements. These are some things that, that, that God says, here are some guidelines for your life. First thing was to do justly. And if you remember, we found out that the justice of God, that God is the just one, that what God says goes, plain and simple. Also, the second thing we learned in part number two is to love mercy. To love mercy, what does that mean? That we are to operate in the loyal covenant love of God. And that we are to be a covenant people, keeping the love of God and operating in that love. And tonight I really tried, I, I got to admit to you, I really tried to get away from this. I was going to come up here tonight and say there is no part number three uh, because, you know, on Sunday mornings we're going through this series about the war between pride and humility. So for me, for me to get up here and, and, and deliver a message about walking humbly with God, you just need to get the morning message. And so I started on another track and started on another message, and God brought me back around and showed me some things and pointed out some things to me that I believe are going to encourage you and I tonight. They're going to build our lives, and and as we walk out of this place tonight, we're going to have some tools, some things in our hand, and and some real valuable things for each and every one of our lives. Some of it, yes, may be review. You might remember these verses, may have heard them before and remembered them, but as we apply them to what we're talking about tonight, I believe that you're going to see some things in a new light. Be encouraged. Guidelines for living part number three, we're talking about this, that he has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. The last thing, the last guideline that we're going to take a look at tonight is walk humbly with your God. Now, on Sunday mornings, like I said, we've been going through this series, and we've seen that humility is different from pride in that pride is self-exaltation, and humility is God-exaltation. 
that no longer are we trying to promote self, now we're trying to promote God. And, and it's not thinking less of yourself. Sometimes people think that humility, there's a sort of a humble going around like that, and, and it's just a bunch of baloney talking about that, that humbleness is that you have to be broke down, busted, and disgusted. God never meant that for our lives. God doesn't want us living low lives. No, God wants us to be high lives. But the way to up, the Bible says, is down. That you're not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. That, that, that now you're not exalting yourself, you're exalting God. This morning we even learned about submission, how submission and humility go hand in hand. And as we lower ourselves under the mighty hand of God, as we sub come under the mission and the leadership of God, that God will exalt us in due time, that God is the one who raises us up as we come underneath his mission, his will, his way, his plan. And so as I was thinking about this, I, I, I was thinking about another definition that our pastor gave a while back about Humility. What does it mean to walk humbly? Well, anytime you see the word walk in the Bible, you can understand that it means to live out your life. That your walk is your life. And how you live your life, the Bible describes that as walking. We're, we're all walking. We're all on a journey. And that's why I love the guidelines. God has painted lines on our journey, on our walk, to keep us in a direction, to show us different pitfalls, to keep us in order, and, and they're there for our benefit, they're there for our blessing, they're there so that we don't get off track, they're there so that we get on the right destination, they're there so that we don't get in harm's way or go into another lane where things could come and crash into us and collide with us and hurt us. And here's the definition of humble, is that we live a life that's totally dependent on God. What does that mean? That means you're submitted to His Word. What does that mean? That means that it's not about you providing for yourself. No, it's about you trusting in God to provide for yourself. That now it's no longer about me and the almighty I, but no, it's about he and the almighty God. And so we are totally, utterly dependent on God for everything. That we live a life that if God doesn't come through, if God's not approving of it, if God's not into it, it's not gonna happen. Why? Because we are totally, utterly dependent on on him. That's why the Bible says, in you I live and move and breathe and have my being. See, that's a total dependence on God. That's somebody who's saying, God, the breath that I breathe, Lord, I, I can't even store it up for myself. I can't create it myself. God, I ha got to have it from you. Yeah. The Bible describes Jesus in the Messianic prophecies that from the time of his womb, he clung to the Lord. He, he was thrown upon the Lord. He had to trust in God all throughout his life. They're nursing at his mother's side. He was humble. He was dependent on God. He was the lowly servant and submitted himself to the will and to the way of God. And you and I, as we live out our life, sometimes we, we see the things that life entails. There's a lot that goes on, a lot of distractions, a lot of things to get us off course. And, and we've got to stick to the guidelines to do justly what God says goes, to love mercy, to operate in his loyal covenant love, and to walk humbly, to, to stay in the lines. You know, as children, we, we learn to color inside the lines, right? Why, why did they do that? They were trying to teach us something. They were trying to teach us form and order and fashion. And, and, and now we know that there are certain times where, where you can break those rules and you can go outside of the lines and you can do things. And, and that's, that's awesome. That's cool. But the basic idea is, 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 is if you're going to make a picture and make it look like something, the best way to make it look like that is to stay inside the lines. I have three children, and each one of my three children, uh, when they come to church here, children's church, I, I guarantee you tonight I'm going to get some sort of a craft from what they learn tonight. Usually it's about some sort of an attitude, maybe the fruit of the Spirit, you know, is kindness. And so they'll have a little coloring thing about kindness. And so a lot of times it's about a family, you know, and, and, and it's teaching the kids on their level about this this topic, this subject. So if it was kindness, they might have a brother and a sister, and the brother's being kind to his sister, and she scraped her knee, and he went and got her a Band-Aid, and he's running to put the Band-Aid on her knee. And so they color these pictures, and my daughter, she's, she's seven right now, and so she's coloring very pretty. She's inside the lines. You can see all the details. You can see, you know, the little girl has the same color hair as her, and the little boy has the same color hair as her brother, and all of a sudden you're making some connections, and she's getting it. She's learning it. Now, my five-year-old, he's starting to get there. You know, he's starting to realize, okay, if I color inside the lines, it's cool, you know, and, and, and it's safe. And, and, and so he's, he's kind of getting there, and he's starting to arrange things, you know. And so you're like, oh, okay, cool, you know. Hey, all right, yeah, the shirt's blue, the hair's blonde. The, okay, I get it, I get it. 
And then I have a two-year-old. And my two-year-old grabs whatever crayon he can find. And that crayon becomes the instrument of destruction, right? <laughs> what does he do? He just goes after that paper. And he's going this way. He's going that way. And he rubs it all around. You know, and then what does he do? He runs up, Daddy, Daddy. And he's shaking the paper in my face. And I lift it up. And, it, you know, depending on the color, if it's yellow, I know exactly what's going on in the picture, right? Why? Because I can see right through it. Okay, you can still see the black lines underneath. But if he grabbed purple, it's going to take me a while. And you and I, we can live a life where we look at it and we say, man, this is a mess. I don't really know what's going on. Why? Because we just did whatever we want to. Or we can stick to the guidelines that God's given us, guidelines for living and do things his will, his way. And we can see a beautiful picture of what God has outlined for you and I. It's a life that's totally dependent on God. For my artist friends that want to break those rules, go ahead. Do some abstract. I love it. Turn me to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 6. Very familiar verses in Matthew chapter 6, but let's take a look at this in light of what we're talking about tonight, being totally and utterly dependent on God. Matthew chapter number 6, Jesus just got done talking about money. You can't serve God in money. Can't be attached to that spirit of mammon that's behind it. Serve that and think that you're going to be able to serve God. Choose one or the other. Choose you this day whom you will serve. I already heard it tonight. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And then look at what he says in verse number 25. Matthew chapter 6, verse number 25. Very familiar verses, but good for us to refresh ourselves in these things often. Look at what it says. Matthew chapter 6, verse number 25. He says, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Look at what he says. It's not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Let that sink in for a minute. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? All of us would say, of course it is. Of course it is. Life is much more than that. Life includes family. Life includes Dreams and visions and goals, futures. Life includes relationships. And, and life is a lot more than just food and clothing. But yet we spend a lot of time worrying about those things. How am I going to get that? How am I going to make that? We look at magazines and television and we say, I can't look like that. I, I, I can't have that build or, you know, that, that curvature. You know, those people must be airbrushed. So people have got to be unreal, you know. I, I can't do that. And we spend a lot of time worrying about those things. How are people going to view me? And yet God is saying, don't worry about that stuff. Rely and depend on me. Verse 26, look at the birds of the air. For they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Wow. Are you not of more value than they? Aren't you worth more than a bird? Of course. Of course, Jesus didn't die for birds. He died for you. He died for me. That means we're more valuable than a bird because the price was paid for us. And yet, birds aren't sitting there wondering, my goodness, where am I going to find my next worm? You know, we ate out of this field all day today. And, and tomorrow's coming, and I think we might have ate too much. We didn't leave enough. You don't see birds going and gathering the seed that people put out for them and going to the ground and making small rows with their beaks and then planting those bird seeds to make sure that they have something for the next day. Why? They don't care. They just go, they eat, and then when they show up the next day, there's more food. And so Jesus is saying, look at these birds. They're onto something that we're not onto. They don't worry. They're not stressed. They're not concerned they just know that there's a provision that's waiting for them. Verse 27, which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? How many of you by worrying have ever grown an inch? If anything, you've shrunk, right? Oh my goodness, I just, I don't know how we're going to make it and I just, I, I can't do this on, and, and I just don't, and, and what happens, you're, you're, you're living a small life. Verse 28, so why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that, not, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed 
like one of these. You ever looked at a, a flower and just thought, my goodness, God, you're just amazing. Look at those colors. Look at the delicate petals. Look, look at the intricacies. And then you went and you looked at a different style flower and you said, oh, my goodness, God, you are really amazing. I thought that flower was cool. Look at this one. You know, you go to a botanical garden where they've got that big, uh, you know, atrium or whatever it is, and, and, and it's filled with different types of flowers and, you know, a, a, a bazillion different types of, of delicate, rare flowers from around the world, and you're walking around just in amazement at the shapes and the colors and the smells. And yet God says, that's all fine, but they didn't toil. They didn't work. They didn't labor. They didn't spin. They didn't shear a sheep. They didn't do any of that to get their colors. No, they just simply grew. Why? Because that's how God designed it. And he says, not even Solomon was arrayed like one of these. You know, Solomon had as much money as you could even imagine. More money than you could imagine. I mean, silver in his day, well, they just left it out in the streets because it was so plentiful in his time that it just wasn't a big deal. You know, oh yeah, there's some more silver. And they would pass it by. Yeah, I got enough of that. So Solomon had all the money that anybody could ever want to buy whatever clothes he ever wanted. He could have been shopping wherever he wanted to. Could have had everything custom made, custom tailored. He, he could have been putting on the, 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 the craziest colors or the craziest dyes from around the world. And yet he was never dressed like one of those flowers. Now look at what Jesus likens this to. He says, now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? How am I going to get clothes for my children? How am I going to put shoes on my kids' feet? How am I going to, you know, how am I going to provide? And yet God is saying, listen, have faith in me. If I can clothe the flowers like that, which one day are just out there in a grassy field, and the next day are getting thrown into the fire after they mow the lawn, hey, I can take care of your needs. I can take care of your needs. And then it goes on and it says this. Verse 31, therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows you need all these things. God knows. God understands. God knows where you're at. God sees. God hears. God knows right where you're at. That's why we have to depend on him for all this. It's because our labors, our worries, our strivings are not going to get us what we need. No, faith in God will get us what we need. Amen. Verse number 33, look at what it says. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. All these things shall be added to you. Now, I was reading this and looking over this, and, and very interesting. We'll get to where we're going tonight in a second, but very, very interesting. Uh, pastor Clark Witten, a pastor in Florida, pointed out in, in some commentary, he said that worry is, number one, unreasonable. It's unreasonable. If you look at verse number 25, he says, I say, therefore, to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? We would reason and we would say, yeah, that's true. Our reason would say, yeah, life is more than food and clothes. That's reasonable. What's unreasonable is worrying about it. Worry, number two, he points out, is unnatural. Look at verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. For they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value than they? So it's unnatural. It's, it's not a natural thing to worry about that stuff. And yet... Humans are the only creatures on the planet that worry. The whole of creation gets it and understands that God's going to provide for them, that God will feed them, and that God will clothe them. So it's unreasonable. It's unnatural. Uh, also, it's unhelpful. Verse 27, it's unhelpful. Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? It's unhelpful. It's not going to add anything to your life. It's only going to take away from your life. It's going to steal your time. It's going to steal your faith. It's going to steal your outcomes if you continue to worry. It's unreasonable, unnatural, unhelpful. It's also unnecessary. Verse 28, 
It says, so why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you, not even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Verse 30. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So it's unnecessary. Why do we do this? Why do we spend so much time when God's going to clothe you anyway? God's going to take care of your needs anyways. It's unnecessary to worry. And finally, it's unbelieving. If you really boil it down to what it really is, it's not faith. It's not trust. It's not depending and relying on God. It's not humility. It's not walking humbly with your God. No, it, it, it's unbelieving. It's doubt, it's fearful, and it's unbelief. Verse 31, therefore do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Saying, what shall we eat? Saying, what shall we the focus is now off of God, and now it's placed on yourself, and out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Doubt, fear, and unbelief will start to pour out of your mouth. That's a good indicator of where you're at. When you start listening to what you're saying, if it's complaining, if it's doubt, if it's fear, if it's unbelief, you're in the wrong lane. And it's time to get back into the guideline that God has laid out for you and I. God put those there for us, for our benefit. God wants us to get to our destination. God wants us to get where we're going. And yet, a lot of times, we can derail our destiny with the words of our mouth. Notice he says, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, their priority is on those things. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. But seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. All these things shall be added to you. And that's really where I want to go tonight. Is that we are to, to be a people that seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto us. That is walking humbly with your God. Tonight as we take a look at this, we'll, we'll see this more. But I wanted to read a, a little poem to you from a guy by the name of Grossart. And he says this, Courage, though the skies are clouded, blackest clouds will pass away. Courage, though the future is shrouded, all is clear to him as day, and his purpose shall endure, ever faithful, ever sure. See, God is going to take care of your needs. God is going to take care of your life. God's going to take care of that which concerns you. Your job and my job is to humbly walk with him, that we're to stay close to him, that we are to depend on him, that we are to be at his side, that we are to be there looking to God. You know, the Bible says in the book of Psalms that we look to you, O Lord. We look to you. Our eyes are are upon you. Man, when the enemies were coming against you, they said, God, our eyes are upon you. When there was a drought and a famine, our eyes are upon you. When they didn't know what to do, when they didn't know where to turn, when people had turned their backs on them, our eyes are upon you. I pour out my soul to you, O oh God. They clung to God and they were dependent on God and they, they attached themselves to God. So if we're going to be people walking humbly with God, we got to remember something about ourselves, that we're kingdom people. Jesus Christ bestowed upon us a kingdom. Jesus Christ wants us to attach ourselves and, and draw from that kingdom. He wants us to be kingdom-minded, kingdom-living, kingdom-resourced people. He wants us to be a people that are walking humbly with him. So tonight I'm going to make a statement. We'll, we'll complete it a couple times. Here's the statement. People walking humbly with God have a kingdom. They have a kingdom something. Okay? And so we'll discuss what that is. Three things that we see out of this verse in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 and the first one is that people walking humbly with God have a kingdom priority. Number one is that we have a kingdom priority. If we're going to walk humbly with God, if we're going to be dependent on God, then we have to have a kingdom priority. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, look at what it says. But seek first the kingdom of God. Everybody say that with me. You guys are a little bit quiet tonight, so I, I got to get you involved. Can't have you just sitting there staring, okay? Because, uh, you know, you'll walk out of this place and say, man, I, I didn't get anything. So you, I want you to get a hold of this tonight. So I want you to say that with me on the count of three. Here we go. Seek first. Okay, one, two, three. Seek first. That's your priority. That's the first thing. When you get up, first things first is kingdom of God. How do you attach yourself to that? How do you get to that? Hey, get in prayer. Get in the word. Start to set your heart and your mind on things above, as Colossians chapter 3 says. You've got to seek first the kingdom of God. You know, when your priority, number one, is God, and you're seeking first the kingdom of God, then all of a sudden your life starts to wrap itself around that. 
Now your family is no longer there just to make you feel good about yourself. No, your family is there to be a witness. Your family is there to reflect and relate the kingdom of God to other people that, that hey, you know what? Yeah, the world, 50% of the world's marriages end in divorce, but look at a good godly example of marriage. Yes, there are many parents that are bad parents out there, and you may not have had a father, but look at this example of a father. Yes, you, you may not understand, and you might wonder about what the role of women is in society, but look at the woman of virtue. Look at the Proverbs 31 woman that's living in this house, in this, in this family. That means that when your priority is the kingdom, no longer is your business there to take care of your physical needs. Why? Because God's going to clothe you. God's going to feed you. You don't have to worry about that stuff. No, now your business is a business that's going to build the kingdom of God. And now your free time and your energies and what you're doing, now those things are wrapped around the kingdom of God. My wife and I, we, we took a, a vacation this summer. And I remember on our vacation, we prayed and we said, Lord, this vacation is cool. This vacation is for us. But God, there's a divine appointment, Lord. Go ahead and set it up. Pencil us in, God. We're available. We're ready for you, Lord. And throughout that vacation, supernatural things happened. I, I believe that God was pouring some things into us during that time. And so, you know, we, we tried to share our faith here and there. But you know what? Praise God. God had some divine appointments for us. God had some things that took place. I remember we were ministering one time. We got a phone call ministering to a person on the phone call, and our hearts were heavy. And here we are in line at a Target buying a backpack because I forgot to bring a backpack, you know. And so here we are bringing a backpack and, uh, and buying a backpack. And the guy behind us is just whistling like I've never heard whistling before. I'm sorry, Dr. Becker. I know you're very skilled in whistling, but this guy, if you've never heard Dr. Becker whistle, you just need to go see him sometime and, and just hang out with him. Uh, but... But this guy, it was unreal. I mean, it was like heaven's birds were just whistling and chirping. And, 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 and all of a sudden, the guy started singing in French. And I thought, my goodness, this guy is just the happy Frenchman, you know? And, and so we're in line. Now, remember, our hearts were heavy. We just got done ministering on the phone to somebody there in Target. All of a sudden, the guy starts singing, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. See, I remember the tune. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. And my wife and I looked at each other, and it was like just this warm glow of light just started to pour into our hearts. And we started to feel good and started to feel like the presence of God was there. And I remember we, we didn't really say anything. We, we purchased our items, and we walked out. And I mean, the guy looked, I, I, I got to use this terminology, he looked like a, a homeless guy. I mean, the guy, you know, long beard, not, I mean, cut, like cut off pants, shorts type thing. And he was riding a beach cruiser bike. And, and we were walking out. And as we were walking to our car, I'm, I'm not kidding you, we were probably from here to the back of the auditorium away from him. And it, he was still singing. And I could hear him like he was next to me. Now, I don't know if that was an angel or just a happy Frenchman. But I know that God had a divine appointment for us. See, when you seek first the kingdom of God, he'll take care of you. He'll take care of you. You're there in Matthew chapter 6. Turn, uh, keep your finger there. We'll go back to it. But turn me to the book of Luke. It's got to be a kingdom priority. Luke chapter number 14. In Luke chapter number 14. Luke chapter number 14, verse number 26, verse number 27. Luke chapter 14, verse 26 and 27 says this. It says, if anyone comes to me, they're seeking. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters. Now, we look at that and we go, wait, hate? I thought that Jesus was the, 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 the guy who was loving. I thought that Jesus was all about love. He is about love. And what is he doing? He's using hyperbole. How do I know that? Because look what it says. He says, yes, and his own life also. He must, he, he says, and yes, his own life also. He cannot be my disciple. So what is he saying? He's saying that, yes, we're still operating in the love and the agape of God. But he's saying, you've got to have a priority above your father and mother, above your brothers and sisters, above even your own life. 
that you're not going to have a priority on those things above me. No, the number one priority, you're going to seek first the kingdom of God. That's number one priority, and everything else in comparison is like hate. And he goes on in the next verse, and what does he say? He says, and whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. What is he saying? He's saying you're going to have to put so much of a priority on following me, so much priority on Jesus Christ, so much priority on seeking first the kingdom that it will cost you a sacrifice of yourself. It's actually going to pain you to do this. That's the type of priority that we should be placing on the things of God. That's true humility, too, because we don't like pain. We don't like sacrifice. We don't like suffering. We don't like denying ourselves. And we don't like working hard at loving Jesus that much. How do I know that? Because we don't even work that hard at loving our family that much. Amen? Or oh me. That's all right. Praise the Lord. God is good. We're all growing in this area. And that's why we're reviewing these verses is because we're getting this on the inside of us. So these kingdom-minded people, these people that are walking humbly with God. We have a kingdom. People walking humbly with God, number one, have a kingdom priority. We place the things of God first. Kingdom priority above and beyond our family and our own self and our own life and our own comforts. People walking with God, people walking humbly with God have a kingdom priority. Number two, people walking humbly with God have a kingdom authority. Number two, people walking humbly with God have a kingdom authority. Matthew chapter six, verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Notice that we put the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We highlighted that for you on the overheads. What is that? That is the authority of the kingdom of God. That is where you and I come in submission, like we were talking about, to the things of God, that we are under the authority of God. And as we operate humbly under that authority, that something takes place. Now we have a kingdom authority in ourselves. And so, yes, we are submitted to authority, but we are also given authority. And we're going to see this in the Word. But really what it comes down to is this, is that we no longer depend on ourselves for direction. But rather we depend on God for direction. No longer do we draw our decision-making process from the tree of knowledge of good and of evil. Remember that in the garden where Adam and Eve were drawing their decision-making process from the tree because they saw that it was good. Good not according to what God said. God said, if you eat this tree, you eat the fruit of this tree, you will surely die. But they saw that it was good for making them wise. Wise how? In their own self. Discerning both good and evil. Now they're going to determine what's right and what's wrong instead of God determining what's right and what's wrong. Anybody who's been in any sort of the disciplines, whether it's been in the, the armed forces or whether it's been in a, in a job that's, that's high level of involvement and a high level of risk, a lot of times you understand that even though you may not understand the direction that's being given to you, you immediately respond and you immediately obey because it could be a life or death situation. And you take the burden of what's right and wrong, what's good and bad off of yourself and you place it in your superior. And what happens is, anybody who's been under this sort of authority, they know that you must immediately respond, otherwise bad things could happen. In the military, it could be that you lose your life. In, in a, in a high-risk job situation, it could be that you lose a limb or that someone else gets harmed because of something that's going on. And so what you have to do is you have to respond. When they say, get down, you immediately hit the deck. When they say, turn the machine off, you immediately turn the machine off. Why? Because there's something going on. Now, we understand that concept here on the earth, but when it comes to God, it's like God is saying, get down. And we say, why? God says, stop. And we say, why? Instead of understanding that we're under authority, God's authority, we need to be submitted to his word. Look at, uh, you're there in Matthew chapter 6. Hold your finger there and turn to the last chapter in Matthew, Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter number... 28. Matthew chapter number 28, Jesus is resurrected. He's speaking to his disciples. Matthew chapter 28, verse number 18. You know this is the Great Commission, but take a look at what Jesus says. Matthew chapter 28, verse number 18 says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority. Everybody say, All authority. All authority. One more time. All authority. Say, All authority. 
all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So Jesus comes and he says, because I've been raised from the dead, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. That means that Jesus Christ, what he says, goes. He's the just one. And so we're going to do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God, right? All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. What he says goes. Verse number 19, go therefore. Now the therefore is there for a reason. In other words, because of what I just said, because of the fact that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, now I'm commanding you to do something. To do what? To go therefore. And to make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, a couple of things that I want to point out to you. Number one is that Jesus gives a commandment to go to do something, to make disciples. And as we make disciples, we don't teach them to do our will, to do our way. No, we teach them everything that he's commanded us. So we teach them to do his will, his way. Why? Because all authority has been given to him. He is now the commanding officer. He is now the boss. He is the Lord. Lord means boss. He's the one that's in control. And when he says to do, we do, even though we don't understand. That's walking humbly. That's true submission is when you don't understand, and yet you do it anyways because you've been told. And look at what he says, and lo, I am with you always. See, if we get a picture that Jesus Christ is with us in all things, it will change the way that we act. We won't be quick to shout off at the mouth if we know that it's going to land on the ears of Jesus. We won't be quick to look at something we shouldn't if we know that Jesus is looking too. We won't be quick to speak evil of somebody or to gossip if we know that Jesus is standing in the circle with us. See, Jesus says, Lord, I'm with you always. What does that mean? That means that he's there with us. He, he's going through this process with us. We have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us. Now, that's not only a negative thing, as we've seen in, in, in areas of sin, but that's also a positive thing in the fact that if Jesus tells you to do something, he knows the outcomes, and it's for your good. And also, when we start to do God's will, God's way, then the power of the Holy Spirit can move on us and can empower us, give us the grace that we need to do what he's commanded us to do. That's good news. It's all right to say amen tonight. Amen. Praise the Lord. God is good. So that's being under authority, but let's take a look at also the authority that's been given to us as we walk humbly with our God. You're there in Matthew chapter number 28. Turn with me to Mark chapter 16, last chapter in the book of Mark. Mark chapter 16. Remember, all authority had been given to Jesus. He says, go therefore, so go under my authority, go out there and make disciples, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. Mark chapter 16, starting in verse number 15, he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Sound familiar? Remember, there's a commandment, and look at what he says, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. So if we are believing and baptized, immersed in Water, right? Water baptized, but also baptized into Christ, the Bible talks about. It talks about the baptism of the Holy Spirit that we receive. Okay, so really what it's talking about is if you believe and are immersed in Christ, you are baptized, you repent from dead works, and now you are going God's ways, you will be saved. It says, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Verse 17, and these signs will follow those who believe. So if you are a believer, if you're under that authority of God and immersed in Christ and walking humbly with your God, this is what's going to follow you around. Not that you're going to follow this stuff around. It's going to follow you around. You get the difference? Because there are people out there that follow this stuff around. But this stuff should not be followed. This stuff should be following every person who's a believer. Why? Because they're walking humbly. And as they walk humbly, now they receive the kingdom authority. These signs will follow those who believe in my name. What is that? That's the authority. You have the power of attorney for Jesus Christ here on the earth. That's an amazing statement. I don't know if that really sunk in right now, but you, Christian, you, believer, have the power of attorney. What does that mean? That means that it's as if Jesus himself was on the earth saying it. So he says, in my name, in my authority, with the power of attorney, what will they do? Look at, in my name, they will cast out demons. That means that when you say to a demon, 
get out in the name of Jesus and don't return. It's as if Jesus was saying it. Wow. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. Tonight we're going to break out the serpents for you. Thank you for laughing because that is a joke. We're not going to do that. Some of you guys that are new here are like, whoa, I, I didn't know I came to that kind of church. We don't do that unless Pastor Luke's preaching. <laughs> they will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. Look at this. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. My goodness, these are the signs that are going to follow those who believe. Now, that doesn't mean we go out and we pick up snakes and we drink poison and all that kind of stuff. That's, that's foolishness. It says if. So, accidentally, God's going to cover you. God's going to watch over you. But he says, taking up serpents, you know, the devil's a serpent. There are lots of demonic spirits out there that we've been given authority over. And if there's a principality or a power or something that's coming against us, or if something comes into us that could potentially harm us, yes, it applies to the physical, but I believe it also applies to the spiritual. We drink a lot of stuff. A lot of things go in. So Jesus says he's going to cover you. If they, if they drink any deadly thing, it shall by no means hurt them. And then he says, they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Wow. They will. They will recover. These are the signs that follow. Why? Because you have the authority. You have the power of attorney. You've got the power of the name of Jesus. Next time you start having a headache, you lay hands on yourself. Why? Because I'm a believer, and, and, and these signs will follow them that believe they will lay hands on the sick. Well, I'm the sick, and these are my hands, so I'm going to lay hands on the sick, and I shall recover in the name of Jesus be healed. You just start to speak that. Next time a coworker or a neighbor or a friend that's an unbeliever starts to talk about, man, I just can't tell you how bad I feel. I can't tell you how sick I am. You say, well, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to lay hands on you, and you're going to get better, not because of your own power. Why? Because you're totally, utterly reliant on God. If he doesn't show up, it's not going to happen. But let me tell you something, church. Jesus Christ will not let one of his words fall to the ground. No, he's going to perform that word which he spoke. Last thing for tonight, last thing for tonight. Those that walk humbly with God have a kingdom prosperity. Have a kingdom prosperity. Oftentimes we shy away from this and we say prosperity. Well, you know, we're not a prosperity preaching church. We've already talked about snakes and, and now you're talking about prosperity, pastor. I just don't understand what kind of church this is. I knew I should have gone to that other church tonight. And yet it's a very real thing in the Word of God. Turn back with me to Matthew chapter number 6. I want you to see this in your Bible. Jesus is speaking. My Bible, it's red letter edition. It's red letter edition. Matthew, ch Matthew, six. Test. Matthew chapter 6, verse number 33. Look at what it says. It says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. Can I ask you a question? What things? All things, all these things. He's just been talking about what? Clothing. He's been talking about what? Food. He's been talking about the things that we worry about, the things that we strive for, the things that we labor for. God knows you have need of those things. And worrying isn't going to get you there. Striving isn't going to get you there. Doubt, fear, and unbelief is not going to get you there. But walking humbly with God and depending on him for those things as you put the priority, first things first, Jesus Christ, his kingdom, and his righteousness, his will, his way, his kingdom authority over my life and me operating in that authority, God's going to take care of the rest. All these things will be added unto you. So you have a kingdom priority, you have a kingdom authority, but you also have a kingdom prosperity. If you are a king's kid sitting at the king's table, you have a king's portion. And sometimes people say, that sounds selfish, and I feel guilty that I have, and there are others that don't have. Listen, in the kingdom of God, there's more than enough for all of God's children. This is not an exclusive gospel where only the select few get to prosper and be blessed. 
This is a gospel that goes to all the nations. This is a gospel that's not governed by natural, physical things. So when we talk about prosperity, we're not just talking about finances. This is not limited to status stuff, earth stuff. You know what all that is? It's dirt, and it's going to burn in the end. People may get buried in their DeLoreans and their Cadillacs and all that kind of stuff. Listen, it's going to burn. You don't get to take any of it with you to heaven, but what you do get to take is the wealth of the kingdom. And the wealth of the kingdom is not limited to finances, but does include finances. We see people all throughout the Bible that were very wealthy. I could tell you about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. A lot of times people say that's Old Testament. Okay, can I tell you about Barnabas? the son of encouragement, the one who trained Saul to become Paul, the one who went and got him and, and, and got him ready for ministry, the one who went with him on missionary journeys. You know, this guy was so wealthy, he was selling land. And he laid it down at the disciples' feet for the needs of the church. This was a wealthy man. There were wealthy women who funded the ministry of Paul and also wealthy women who funded the ministry of Jesus. Why? Because there was a priority on the kingdom of God. And that wealth that was brought into their life, they realized that it had a purpose. They realized that it was under authority, and they used that into the kingdom of God to prosper the kingdom of God. That's why God puts finances in your hands and in my hands. It's not for us to build our kingdom, but it's for us to build his kingdom. And when you rely on God in the air of your finances... Walk humbly with him. He'll take care of it. He'll take care of it. Listen, what God orders, he'll take care of the bill. Listen, if I invite you to dinner and I say I'm paying, hey, doesn't matter what's ordered, I'm paying. If God invites you into the kingdom and starts giving you direction and orders, God, I don't know how I'm going to do that. I don't have the money for that. God, I don't understand. God will take care of the bill. God will bring prosperity in your hands. Last verse for tonight. You guys still here? Yes. Praise the Lord. Romans chapter 14, verse 17. I'll put it up on the overhead for you. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. We've been talking about clothes, talking about food. Kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. Look at this. But righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's true prosperity. doesn't matter if you live in a cardboard box in the middle of a field. If you are happy and fulfilled in life, that's wealth. If you've got the joy of the Lord and you are at peace, that's wealth. That's prosperity. If your kids grow up serving the Lord, that's wealth. That's prosperity. If your family's getting saved, that's wealth. That's prosperity. If your neighborhood is getting changed and turned around for Jesus, that's wealth. That's prosperity. If the business place people are starting to do Bible studies at lunch because they're all starting to come into the kingdom, that's wealth. That's prosperity. When this church is filled and people are getting saved and there's people out there getting food and we're going out to the streets and picking people up and busting them in and when we're having Wednesday night harvest celebration and we're welcoming people in, that is wealth and that is prosperity. But we got to rely on God for it. Guidelines for living. Part number one, do justly. What God says goes. Love mercy. Walk in that loyal covenant love of God. Stick to the things of God. Operate in that love. And finally, tonight we learned, walk humbly with God. Live out your life. The kingdom, number one, priority. Putting a priority on the kingdom of God. Number two, kingdom authority. Doing the will of God, the way of God. Being under submission to his will, to his way, and also having that authority. And then finally, kingdom prosperity that we have the resources of heaven available to us, and so we use them with our priority to build the kingdom of God. If you got something from God from this series, let's give God a hand. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Make sure that your heart is right with God before you leave this place. What makes you think you're going to go to heaven? I just want you to answer that question in your heart. No, 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 the answer, but you and God. Some of you may have answered that question and said, well, I, I believe I'm going to go to heaven because I've been a good person. God lets good people into heaven. Really, he does. Because nowhere in the Bible does it say you can be good enough to get in heaven. It doesn't work like that. Sometimes people say, well, I, I'm going to get to go to heaven because I, I attend church. I was raised in church. Parents told me you're a Christian. Hung a cross for St. Christopher around your neck. Had you baptized or Christian as a child. Attended religious classes, Sabbath school, Sunday school, catechism class. Not any of the religion. You're born in America. America's a Christian nation. 
not Buddhist or Muslim or Hindus, therefore we're Christians headed for heaven. Nowhere in the Bible to say you've been raised in church, parents tell you you're a Christian, attend religious classes, wear religious jewelry, be baptized as a Christian as a child, get you to heaven. Nor in the Bible to say that you're born in America that automatically makes you a Christian, that because you're not some other religion, that by default, God loves you in the category of being a Christian. Come on, come on. Nowhere in the Bible to say that. Sometimes people think, well, Pastor, I'm going to get into heaven because, you know, I, I, not only when I was a child was I in church, I'm in church right now. It's great. I'm glad you're in church tonight. I'm glad you came, but show that to me in the Bible, could you? Or you sit in a church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. It doesn't work. Any more than you can go to the Pacific Ocean, call yourself fish, sit in the water, and that makes you a fish. Not going to make it. Not going to happen. You can't just sit in church, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Sometimes people say, but at my last church I got involved. I helped out, sang in the choir, made decisions. People thought of me as a leader. I even got a membership card to that church. That's great. I'm glad you did those things. But show, show that to me in the Bible, could you? Where church involvement gets you into heaven. Helping out, carrying the pastor's Bible, making decisions. People think of you as a leader. You sing in the choir. That that gets you into heaven. God's not looking for your membership card to a church when you enter the gates of heaven. So come on, let's talk tonight. What makes you think you're going to get into heaven? Sometimes people say, but I know God. I could quote scriptures to you, Pastor. Celebrate Christmas and Easter every year of my life. Sing the songs. I know God. Therefore, I'm a Christian. Problem is, you ask anybody in America, do you know God? They'll say, yeah, I know God. Do you know Jesus? Yeah, I know who Jesus is. That doesn't make them a Christian. In fact, if you read your Bible, the demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians headed for heaven. The Bible says the devil himself believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and can quote scriptures. You'll find that in your Bible, and yet he's not a Christian. So everybody look up at me for a second. This is not about what you have in your head. This is not about some mental ascent towards God, having head knowledge about who Jesus is. Rather, it's about your heart. Listen, we can't get to heaven your way. Can't get to heaven my way. Can't get to heaven some well-meaning church committee's way. We've got to get there God's way. And Jesus Christ said these words. He said, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. That's it. Can't get there any other way. You must be born again. Now, I know our society's made a mockery out of that term, and they made it out to be something that it's not. It's not about what society says. It's about what the Bible says. What does being born again mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you in the book of Revelation. Third chapter, Jesus speaking to a church, just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are graphic words for the mouth of Jesus. What's he talking about? What's he saying, lukewarm? What's that all about? Well, it's a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and then, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with God, you're not going to make it. And I love you enough tonight to tell you the truth, respect you, and honor you enough not to play games. You're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, I'm going to give you an opportunity. Remember, we're doing this God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, your call, your choice. In a moment, I'm going to count to three, just like this. One, two, three. Slap my hand on this pulpit. One, two, three, like this. Bang! When you hear the sound of my hand, pop on that pulpit. Bang! That's your opportunity to lift your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, 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 wait a second. You're going to count, point and count? Uh-huh. But, Pastor, I'll be embarrassed. Uh-huh. You might be. But get over that embarrassment. Why? Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever, never, 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 and ever? No one would make that trade. Tonight, come on. You can give God all your heart and all your life in this safe and friendly place. We've all done this in some form, some fashion, one time or another. Now it's your turn. Will you give God all your heart and all your life? Jesus went to the cross, beaten, bloody, publicly. For you and I, we can raise our hands in the safe and friendly church service. We need to get right with God tonight. So who should raise their hand in a moment? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand? You're not sure about your salvation. Come on tonight, make sure. Who should raise their hand? If you've never done this, never given God all your heart and life, come on, tonight I'm speaking to you. Finally, who should raise their hand in this place? If you're lukewarm, you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Hey, come on, 
Let's make a right relationship with Jesus Christ tonight by simply raising your hand and acknowledging your need for Jesus. Remember, we're doing this humbly, doing this God's way. So tonight, get ready to get your hands up if that's you. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, or if you're watching by television in the foyer or the Love Rock Cafe, hey, you can lift your hand up right where you're at and tell an usher right afterwards or come into the church service. All right? I'm going to count to three. Pop my hand on this pole, but this is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high. Raise them up high. If that's you, you know you need to give God all your heart. You know you need to give God all of your life tonight. If that's you, just raise your hand up high where I can see it. Come on. Pop it up. Pop it up. Pop it up. Where are you at? Come on. Come on. If that's you, just pop it up. Don't be afraid. I don't want to be the first. Well, listen, you don't want to go to hell. You say, Pastor, you're being mean. I'm not being mean. Hell is a very real place, and I don't want you to go there. You don't want you to go there. And listen, God doesn't want you to go there. That's why he sent Jesus, who's never made for you and I. He's made for the devil and his angels. Come on, if that's you tonight, come on, come on. Just pop it up. Don't let anything distract you. Ask yourself that question. If I was to die right now, do I know where I would end up? Would I go to heaven or would I go to hell? And what makes me think I'm going to heaven? Is it because of my will, my way? Is it because I did good things? Is it because I went to church? Or is it because I gave my heart and life to Jesus? If it's anything other than I gave my heart and life to Jesus, come on, you need to get right with God tonight. Just examine yourself. And if you know that's you, you need to get your hand up. Come on, go for it. Go for it. Go for it. Go for it. Thank you, Juan. Anybody else? Real quick, real quick. Come on, pop it up. Pop it up if that's you. You know you need to get right with God. Come on. Didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. If that's you, come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. Anybody else real quick? Anybody else? Where are you at? Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else real quick? Come on, if that's you. You know you need to get right with God. Come on. Come on. Just pop it up. I'll just give you a moment. We're a couple minutes later. You guys okay hanging out for just, just another minute while we invite people? Come on, if that's you, we'll let you go in a minute. But God is holding this all up just for you. The Spirit of the Lord is just working on your heart. If you, if you feel that tug on your heart, you know you need to do this. Come on. Come on. There's... Take a moment. God loves you so much. He's just waiting for you. Just waiting for you. He loved you enough to send Jesus. Now he's loving you enough to wait for you. Anybody else real quick? Anybody else? Last call. I'm going to close this up. You're going to miss this opportunity. If that's you, you need to do this. Come on, don't miss this opportunity. You've missed enough opportunities with your life. Come on, this is an opportunity for eternal life. If that's you. Just pop it up. Last call. Last call. I'm closing it up. Closing it up. Anybody else? Anybody else in this section? Anybody else? Anybody else in this section? Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. All right. Let's give the Lord a hand. Hallelujah. The Bible says that heaven rejoices over one sinner that repents. Praise God. Let's be happy. Let's be happy. Now, those of you that raised your hand or if you should have raised your hand but you didn't, here's what we're going to do quickly, quickly. We want you to get your stuff, whatever you brought with you to church. Get a friend if you need a friend. Once you get in the aisle and meet me up front, we're going to change destinies tonight. But we can't do that till we get you down here. So if you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, you come right now. Just get your stuff. Get a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front. No one leaves. Let them come forward right now. Come on, come on, come on. They're coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. You can come too. You can come too. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Anybody else if you need to come? Thank God you've come. Thank God you've come. I want to introduce you to a friend of mine. This is Pastor Dave right here. Pastor Dave's a really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. You already got past me and all my jokes about snakes and stuff. Okay, Pastor Dave's cool, all right? He's going to pray with you, give you some free stuff, introduce you to a friend here in the church that will help you to walk with God, live out your life in the ways of God. He'll describe how it works, and then he'll let you come right back out. Now, let me make a promise to you, okay? Give God a year of your life here at this church. And next year, about this time, when it comes around, you'll look back on this year, 
And you'll say, my goodness, I didn't know it could be like this. Okay? God's going to do something great in your life. If, you get, if you'll just make a left turn and follow Pastor Dave right this way. Let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord.